What's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm here in New York. I'm actually in River, where am I in New York? I don't know the city. We're River Park Farm. We're in Kipps Bay, Manhattan. We're in Kipps Bay, Manhattan. And in a second, you're going to see like exactly where we are geographically in Manhattan because it's pretty crazy. But I'm here with Jonathan Sumner, he's the farm manager here. And it's a pretty epic farm. There's some really interesting stuff going on in some of the most expensive real estate in in New York, at least, right? And probably the country, I would, yeah. I would guess. Yeah, and he's doing some really cool inventive stuff. And we're growing in 100% milk crates. Yeah. 100% milk crates. And how many are there? 3,200 in production. There's, th there's 3,200 milk crates in production here, which to me it boggles the mind. I'm used to a front yard garden like probably many of you are, or a backyard garden. So we're going to get into it. We're going to get really deep and we're going to talk about all the intricacies of how he's doing it because that's certainly abnormal even by the scale of urban farming which is like an abnormal thing to do generally speaking you know uh, so he's doing some really cool stuff so we're gonna go really deep really hope you guys enjoy it stay tuned let's get to it so welcome to the greenhouse here at River Park Farm. Uh, this is kind of where everything gets started. In the spring, this will be full of all my tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, uh, basically everything that I'm growing from seed, which is most of what we have out here. In the warmer months though, when I have everything planted out, I move a lot of my microgreens in here. And I still have some starts getting ready for the fall season. These are all different Asian greens, top soy, pak choy. Um, this is kind of uh, my little safe space, uh, my little controlled environment where these guys get to get a, get a good head start and flourish. And you're growing 100% of everything you grow here goes straight to the restaurant, which is not like 20 feet away, right? Correct. Yes, yeah. we are just outside the restaurant now. Got it. Um, so everything I grow here, it's, it's all a collaboration between the chef and I. Uh, in the winter, we get together with the seed catalogs. We talk about what's worked well in this environment, what hasn't worked well in this environment, things that I want to experiment with and that he would want to experiment with. Um, and collaboratively, we get together and select the seeds and get things going. And yeah, everything we, so everything we grow goes straight to the restaurant. Um, super fresh, farm to table stuff. We have relationships with other farmers as well. Uh, but we always try to feature what I grow here on site. And you're doing some micros on the on your right side here too, right? Correct. Yeah, we've got all micros here. Having a relationship with the chef, he can request uh, things at different sizes. So some of my micros I let grow a little bit longer. Uh, it looks like about to the second true leaf. Second true leaf, yeah. On these, yeah. Um, you know, and it all depends on how he wants to, to plate them and, and how, how much he wants to feature the micros themselves. And what's uh, nice about that is he can say, I want this, I want it this way, and then he can come out and pick it, or you can come harvest it, and it's on someone's plate in, in three minutes, right? right? Yeah, often, you know, just washed, never even refrigerated. Yeah. Uh, always harvesting, you harvesting every day, often right before meal time. Yeah, cool. And then once we get out of here, we kind of get into the meat of of the farm, which is, which is the uh, milk crates. Right. Yeah. And we'll do a little quick look at exactly where we are. This is Bellevue Hospital. It's one of the biggest psych hospitals in the country. We are on the footprint of what was the original Bellevue Hospital. But yeah, extremely urban environment. I get a lot of shade from these big buildings. <laughs> yeah, I bet. You know, if you look around, it's nothing but huge buildings and uh, we got a little bit of green here. So. Yeah. Yeah, take a look at where exactly we're farming at. We are. We're in the milk crates. One thing I, one thing that's really interesting about this is, you know, it's not so much a rooftop farm um, in that we are, you know, underneath all of these buildings, but we're also not on the ground. Uh, this is kind of a plaza. This would be the roof of a parking garage. Um, so some of the challenges of a rooftop farm without the luxury of all that sunlight. So. Right. Right. So we're here on one half or not even one half, actually the other side is much larger, but you're doing some unique stuff over here, and as we said, it's all in milk crates, guys, which is, to me, insane. I've grown in milk crates before, but obviously I haven't grown in 3,200 of them, and I haven't grown the variety of crops that Jonathan's growing, and you've got some cool stuff right here. We've got beans, but this is a specific type of bean that you're growing for the chef. Right, so on the note of collaborating with the chef, one of the things he asked me for this year uh, was to grow lima beans. He was saying in all of his experience as a chef, uh, and going to farmers markets, all the different suppliers, he's never been able to find fresh lima beans. Um, and I myself had never seen or had 
a true fresh line of bean. Yeah. Uh, they have kind of a bad rap in the bean world as being sort of like the thing your mom told you to eat and she would like ground you if you didn't eat it. Do you just sit at the table like pouting? That's right. what I did at least. Yeah, and, and <laughs> you know, for decent reason, they're not as good if they're dried or, or frozen fresh. Yeah. So this is something that I've been really excited about. Um, you know, obviously the flowers are also edible and we'll use those as garnish on the uh, dishes that we serve the lima beans on. Yep. Um, so get various stages of life on the same plate. Um, but these have become one of my favorites uh, to grow, one of my favorite snacks while I'm here working. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you time them just right before they get starchy, they're incredibly sweet and delicious. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, we're going to head over to the other side. There's a lot of cool stuff going on over there. And we're going to talk about like exactly what's going on in the milk crates. And he has these really inventive ways of, of growing in them because there's so many unique challenges. There's like a couple of benefits, and then there's like a lot of unique challenges to them. And he's, he's kind of crafted a lot of interesting work around. So we're going to head over there and check it out. Dish is yeah. insane. It's, yeah. it's my tropea onions, uh, young green onions mm -hmm. that are like cooked in a bag with all these juices, and like uh, they kind of function as noodles on the plate. Okay. And there's fairy tale egg plants, uh -huh. and then it's the lamb chop with my mint, yeah, yeah, mint chutney. And Dude, that's rad. Like, Very cool. Now we're at the northeast side of River Park Farm. And directly this way, which you're gonna see in a second, is just a freeway, and then the river. And so it's, it couldn't be more urban than this. We're probably gonna hear some honks here. But I guess the first thing to talk about is there's 3,200 milk crates here, and the question, I guess, the first question that comes to my mind is like, why that versus the many other ways of growing in an urban environment? Uh, the main reason we chose milk crates uh, would be to have a system that's completely modular, right? Um, this is not the original site of the farm. Yeah. The farm started on the footprint of this building back here. Um, construction had halted, and so the restaurant asked if you know we could grow some vegetables there. Yeah, um, and they agreed. Um, but knowing that the farm would eventually have to be moved, uh, we chose to use milk crates, and they're all lined with landscape fabric, mm -hmm. um, and they are super modular. There's not many advantages to <laughs> having 3,200 individual plots of yeah. soil. Uh, we can get into all that. Yep. Uh, it seems like the so the advantages for like the home gardener for a, a milk crate is, is the modularity, and then the downsides you don't even experience as a home gardener. You know, because like you're not growing in, in many many hundreds, right? Let alone thousands. You're not growing with a giant shade cover right over here and uh, some, some other unique things. So let's go ahead, we'll, we'll flip it around. We're gonna look at exactly how he's doing it. Because what he said is he's growing in 3,200 individual plots of soil, which is like a, you might gloss over that, but actually I think it's really important to talk about because that means that even in a raised bed, like my, I've got 10 raised beds in my front yard, that's 10 individual plots of soil, but it's, they're much larger and they're much easier to manage and this, like the soil life is much easier to cultivate and actually keep going over the course of a growing season. Whereas here, we'll get into watering too. You're doing some stuff like you're watering with tap, which means that you might actually be killing not through your own fault, just by the nature of how it works, right. the microbial life and having to bring it back. So we're gonna talk about that, we're just gonna flip it around so you can kind of see just how urban and awesome it is. The UN building is over there, there's like lab testing buildings up here, the river's over there, so it's really, really cool. We're just gonna do a little flip. So at the beginning of this year, uh, we flipped out all the soil in these crates, um, put all new soil in. Two parts potting mix, one part compost. Really important thing for me to do this season is to encourage the microbial life and try to get some uh, life systems and that soil food web going in each and every one of these crates. One of the ways that I'm doing that is by cover cropping this year. What I have here uh, is a cover crop of peas. Um, obviously legumes are gonna reintroduce nitrogen back into the soil. Um, and this is a winter kill cover crop. 
What that means is when the frost hits and these freeze, they will die. Um, and I will just leave them where they lay to create an organic layer for that microbial life. So when I come back in the spring, I will put a layer of compost on top of that and we'll have a nice uh, layer of organic uh, matter there that all the different bacteria and fungi that I need to do what I do will have something to eat on. And, uh... and it's, I mean, cover cropping is a classic permaculturist technique. But the, even bringing it down to like the raised beds, like I cover crop my front yard raised beds and that even that's kind of like not that common practice, I wouldn't say. Yeah. And then going down to this level where you might even call it like a nano farm, like these tiny, you could you could almost visualize this as if you were looking at it from 10,000 feet, you know, and like these are individual right. plots. Right, right, right. And, and treating each individual plot like sort of with the respect it deserves and treating that cubic foot of soil as a large piece of land and, and doing it appropriately is really interesting to me and I'm yeah. curious to see how it's going to work at that at this scale. Right, well and, and being individual plots, you know, these don't share a microbiome so uh, even if I have the entire bed planted out in one crop, yeah. um, you know, they have no network between them uh, so it's important for me um, to monitor and, and try to, you know, encourage the life in each individual block. And so, question for you about that is, every time, we're going to get into the watering, but every time you water with the New York tap, you've got chlorine in there and you've got some other agents that are sort of deleting your work. Right. And so, does that, how are you going to combat that over the course of a season or multiple seasons? Right. Um, so, yeah, that's a huge challenge. Obviously, microbial life, uh, you know, is essential to the, to the organic farmer. Um, I, for all my... Uh, everything that I transplant, uh, except for the brassicas, um, I inoculate each transplant with mycorrhizal fungi um, to try to encourage that life. And then with the legumes, when I'm uh, transplanting and not direct seed sowing, um, I will introduce bacteria into those as well to help them establish uh, those nodes that help them pull the nitrogen out of the air instead of the soil. All right, so milk crates, irrigation, doing this at scale. There's a crazy matrix-like network of irrigation here, so can you talk a little bit about like the, the setup of an individual milk crate and how you're approaching watering everything and, and sort of working with the soil in each individual plot? Having walls between all these different beds, standard drip irrigation isn't going to work very well. No. Um, so we've kind of uh, adapted tools that you would normally find uh, in a greenhouse, such as these drip spikes here, which you would typically find uh, in like a hanging plant greenhouse is the, yeah. the appropriate application of these. Yeah, like um, a hanging balcony garden or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a one inch pipe that goes all around the farm. I have it split into three different sections. Uh, and each bed it comes down through a three quarter inch tube here. I have a, a T splitter at each mm -hmm. bed so I can prioritize certain beds if they need extra water or not water certain beds if they don't need the water. And then there's a pressure valve here at each at each hole, and then they come out here into these spikes. Um, you know, it's just as a matter of convenience, this is a way that I can deliver water to each crate, but it also is beneficial because when it drips out the bottom, you know, that water is going directly to the roots of that vegetable. Um, so how deep are you planting the spike? Just like three inches deep, right in the center of the, the soil yeah. mass? Yep. Yeah. Um, and, it, and that can change throughout the season too. You know, when I first transplant something, I know just where that root ball is. Um, or if I want to set the spike just outside the root ball and try to, you know, encourage the root growth. Yeah. And it's going to be plant specific to some degree at least, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so, but delivering the water straight to the to where it needs to be. I don't lose water to evaporation. The The big issue I have is just with a uh, landscape fabric liner. Right. Um, if I overwater, I lose a lot of the water out of the bottom and it takes a lot of nutrients with it. Uh, yeah, you're gonna leach, you're gonna leach right. really quickly. Um, so and if, you that, get, if you get rain, are you leaching out like crazy? If or? it's a heavy downpour, yes. Yeah. And you know, that's just a kind of a part of, of you know, the game of farming on concrete tile. Yeah, and you've double stacked the the crates is that, and that's just for sort of ergonomics, right? Yeah, it's just a, a better working level yeah. and also just for aesthetics. Um, although there are challenges to that, uh, the wind blowing underneath uh, in the empty layer. Um, in the winter, 
diesel freeze solid because of oh, that. Oh wow! Okay. Because um, they're getting cooled from every angle. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then also, I'm losing water to evaporation from you know every angle as well. Right. So, yeah. Because it's not solid on the bottom. You have no concrete on the bottom. Yeah. Right. But so I have to monitor the water pretty closely, and then uh, along with these drippers, uh, things that I direct so. Um, things that I'm germinating in this soil. I do have sprinklers that I attach uh, here as well. Um, and so I can top water that way until, Got it. until things are substantial enough to, yeah. to use these. So you can swap methods based on both time of plant growth and also plant specific as far as depth of the soil spike. Yep. All that stuff. Okay, awesome. Cool, so we're here on the uh, northeast side. And as you can see behind Jonathan, there's some, some what? What is this? We got a couple different things growing here, and these are probably two of the tallest crops I grow. Um, what we have here is uh, red okra. Uh, okra is a personal favorite. Uh, it's probably my favorite summertime flavor. Um, so I chose to grow some here for the restaurant. Uh, and another great thing about okra is the flowers are also edible. Uh, one of the things I like to do here is give the chef the opportunity to feature both the produce um, and the flower of that produce on the same plate if they're both edible. Um, yeah, let's take, I'm gonna take a look at this, this okra flower right here. I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with what it looks like. And they open and close throughout the day. So Absolutely beautiful. So that bloomed this, was blooming this morning. Right. Uh, we're now in the middle of the afternoon, so it's closing up. Um, and the sorghum, you guys do some really interesting stuff with the sorghum, so it kind of serves two purposes on the farm. So this tall stuff you see back here that looks like corn is actually sorghum. I grow it here for a couple different reasons. The first reason, um, the way we use it, is we will press the stalks and extract the sweet juice from it um, and actually make a, a syrup sweetener for the bar. Um, for our cocktails. Um, so do, is it like a sorghum simple syrup then? Or? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yep. So yeah. you you uh, you press the stalks, you extract the juice, you cook that down into a syrup. Yeah. Um, and it's extremely sweet. It's just sugar. Yeah. Um, and then I also grow it here on the edge of the farm, uh, so it's visible from the highway. Um, we want people here to know that what we're doing. Yeah, and let's um, take a look over the highway real quick. No better advertisement for it being a highway than, than rap music being blasted as we go by. Yeah, you probably also saw in that shot a little of the Queensboro Bridge and the UN as well. Yeah, definitely a very urban environment. We get a little bit of all of that stuff. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we're here, we're walking actually down towards probably the end of of this side, but there's a lot of cool stuff, and I, I didn't, we don't really have the time to kind of individually film everything, which I wish we did, but as we go by, Jonathan's gonna kind of just say like, hey, here's what we're doing here, and here's like what's going on. So we've got the strawberry patch right here. Strawberries here, um, and uh, I got about three flushes of strawberries every year. 70 um, pounds this year he's pulled out of just these, three sections, which would be how many, do you know how many individual crates are attached for these? Um, no, I don't. I could guess. Uh, Some, maybe somewhere like 150, it seems like? 150, 200? Yeah, I was thinking closer to like 80 or 90. Okay, yeah, so 80 or 90 milk crates, which is, do you know the actual square footage of the milk crate? There's square foot inside. The, so the, inside square, so 80 to 90 square feet in Manhattan, 70 pounds of strawberries that go directly to the restaurant that you can see right there for some probably absolutely delicious desserts and, and dishes and, and Yeah, on desserts and we use the green strawberries uh, in savory dishes. Um, the first flush is always tart, so that'll go uh, for the savories. The sweeter ones in the middle of the summer will go to the desserts. Yeah. Um, and that's what's cool about this place is as we look around, there's some really interesting stuff and you can see how big it is uh, that a commercial farmer or even like a small time urban farmer isn't growing because the economics don't work. Whereas here, the economics really do work very well because of how local it is. You can just go right there. Right. You can grow edible flowers, which we're going to see in a second. We've got the sort of the root crop zone right here. And you've got beets, a couple different varieties of beets going on. Yeah, we always do beets, radishes, carrots, um, turnips as well. And these are the kind of thing where um, you know, I'll pick them very small to use as a garnish. Yep. Um, 
uh, and I'll, I'll thin, you know, I can thin my beds and still use what yeah. I'm thinning. Yeah, that's perfect. And I can do that as the season goes on until they're at whatever size. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you don't have to just know, throw them in a simple salad for yourself because you can give them to a chef and the, the thinnings actually are very valuable in a higher end restaurant, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. That stuff that would, you know, high dollar items at market and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Just because of the transportation costs. Like, and that's, not that, like a small time farmer just can't do that because the transportation cost of the thinnings of a beet. Yeah, well, just, and they're also so fragile. And, yeah, they're yeah, not going to last. You know, at, having to bag them and, and sustain them, you know, to to the market, to yeah. the restaurant. Yeah. Um, but this is stuff that I'm, I'm harvesting straight into the kitchen. So it's, yeah. it's 100 feet away. Yeah. Um, even the most delicate things. They're going to do fine. Do fine <laughs> if, yeah. they're, if they're not, there's like another issue at hand. Right, exactly. Uh, okay, we're going to walk over towards a really cool section um, where we've got some beneficials slash slash pests uh, and our friend is gone right now but this would be the eastern swallowtail the black eastern, black swallowtail. eastern swallowtail so you can see the larva right there very beautiful sometimes the most beautiful ones are the most annoying though I don't know about you guys like I actually think the hornworm looks cool but I don't like it in the garden of course and these guys are hanging out on the carrot bed right yes so these guys love carrots parsley dill fennel Anything in the family? Yeah, anything in the family. I always overplant that family on purpose. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, like, what do you do for the pest control? Because you're they're they're right there, so you're obviously not picking them off. You know, the butterflies are a great pollinator for me. Yep. I think the eastern black swallowtail is a beautiful butterfly. It is. I wish we had the actual shot of it. I can show you guys. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, not just being about production, but also being about. Um, you know, beautifying this space and beautifying this campus. Mm -hmm. uh, butterflies and other insects like that um, help me pass along the narrative of what we're doing here to people in the city that don't often get to see that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's kind of twofold. I'll, yep. let, I'll let them live for now. Yeah, <laughs> until until they get too annoying. Right. And we've got, so let's talk actually a little bit about this section here, which is really neat. Sure. Because you've got the nasturtium. Right. Which grows sometimes as a weed. I mean, you, you'll see that oftentimes in like little hell strips and alleyways and stuff like that, but then chefs prize it. Um, yeah, our executive chef here loves this stuff. Everything, you know, we'll, we'll use micro nasturtium, we'll use the leaves and salads, but also as a puree yep. for some dishes. The stems we use chopped up in the mignonette for the oysters. Obviously the flowers are edible as well. Um, so yeah, nasturtium finds its way into a lot of dishes here mm -hmm. um, in a lot of different ways. It's a complex flavor. Um, there's ways that you can bring out the different complexities of that. And we've got, um, along with that, sort of like the edible flowers or maybe uncommon planting section here. So you've got some edible flowers here going on. Right. Quite a bit of beds. We've got viola flowers here. Um, these don't have much of a flavor, but they're obviously very beautiful and they can really bring a lot of color to the plate. Um, then we also grow borage, uh, which kind of has like a, a cucumber flavor. I think it's a very underrated flower too. So people don't think about it a lot. Right. Yep. And like with you know most other farms, uh, we've got a lot of edible weeds that are really delicious. Like this red clover, we'll use. I'll harvest these and we'll use these flowers. Or this here um, is wood sorrel. Mm -hmm. uh, super sharp, delicious flavor. Not something I you know I've never heard of anybody growing on purpose, but. Uh, <laughs> It, you know, because I'm right here, it's something that I'm obviously, I'm definitely going to harvest it, bring yeah. it into the kitchen. And what's funny to me is the juxtaposition of where we are. You can see behind Jonathan right now, you've got a, what, what was this building? It was like lab testing. Yeah, it's, life a, sciences. it's a life science research facility. You got a life sciences research facility. You've got the old Bellevue, right. which to me feels like the perfect set for like a horror movie. Yep. You know, you've got a fancy restaurant right here, which is where all this food goes. And then you've got the East, the East River right there. The UN, which you can't see through these trees, is, is right there. It's just such a funny juxtaposition to then be growing, you know, sorrel and some of these edible things, especially nasturtium, which to me in my area grows very, very much as a weed. Huh. Not that you wouldn't want it, but it, it grows naturally, right. you know. Uh, it's just so interesting and so awesome to me that that's what's happening in this space, which is so just so epic. So this is something I'm growing just as a passion project. This is indigo, and my plan um, is to do a lot of dyeing with this. Both with the fresh leaves, you get kind of a green teal color out of them when you dye fresh. Um, and there's also a long process of extracting pigment from the indigo, multi-day fermentation process where you can extract the pigment. Uh, what I would like to do with this eventually 
is to start dyeing more things for the restaurant. So uh, special tablecloths for farm dinners, placemats, aprons for the servers, um, ways that I can show off using plants for the restaurant in a way that isn't just food. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of different ways in which we interact with plants in all aspects of our lives that often go unnoticed. And it would be really cool to shine a light on that and do yeah. something really unique for our guests um, that, you know, a lot of people haven't seen done before. So kind of... Yeah, this, I mean, this to me, when you, when we did a little walkthrough beforehand and this to me was the most interesting thing because it's so different. It's 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 growing a plant for something other than consumption to showcase, like, I, I almost say it's like in the evolution of farm to table, or like just bringing it to that next level. Right. Because you're eating on tables made of wood. That's a plant, you know. The mm -hmm. cloth is, is coming, unless it's synthetic, is coming from a plant. Uh, and Jonathan's taking, like, indigo. I mean, can, can you imagine how cool it would be? And it hasn't happened yet, but once this gets dyed, to be, like, serving on uh, maybe a placemat or a place a napkin that's been dyed with the indigo and working in everything else oh, it's just so cool well, it's grown just so, from, it's grown so from seed grown on the same seed, plot of land yeah, pointing they say like hey after you like when you, when you have your affogato or something like walk out and go check out the indigo that di that dyed your napkin you right know? grown next to the dill that's on your plate yeah grown next to the dill that's on your plate we're gonna actually go taste a little bit some of these cool things we have some more little nuances i think that to me, I find fascinating about the, the surprising benefits of proximity, yeah. right? And, and going hyper-local and how that can like sort of unlock really weird sort of second, third order effects that you would never think about in, in local farming. So we're gonna head right down this alley and uh, take a look at that. So we're here at the end of River Park Farm. As you can see, it's a little bright, it's a little harsh. And that brings us to a topic we haven't covered yet, which is the light, because I think this is probably one of the few times a day that this part is going to get extremely bright light because there's the lab sciences, the life sciences buildings kind of boom like this blocking. And so how do you deal with light? I'll pan over here as you, as you chat about it. Sure. Um, so there's only so much I can do. Light is probably my uh, biggest problem here. No section of the farm gets more than five or six hours a day of direct sunlight. I've made a map of which beds get the most sunlight and I have to plant accordingly to that map. I'm, I have to prioritize what goes where based on how much sunlight it's going to get and that's fine when that becomes a problem is when it's time to rotate crops. Um, and you, know, you do something really crazy when it comes to crop rotation. Right, so in order to prioritize the sunlight I can't rotate the crops uh, but I can use the uh, the fact that these are all modular and mobile and I rotate the crates instead. <laughs> um, it's a huge amount of labor, but having an off-season here, I've got time to do it. And so what are we talking as far as rotating the crates? Like, what does that look like? Are you rotating a thousand of them? Are you rotating... Yes. Yeah. Um, not all the crates are going to move. Picking up crates, putting them on carts, kind of taking them off the farm organizing them and putting them back on. That can get a little complicated, uh, requires a lot of, um, you know, keeping track of exactly what crate was where. Um, so I know throughout the seasons, um, through the years that I intend to use the same soil, that soil's history of what's grown in it. Try to do what would be similar to no-till here. Um, so I'm not removing all the roots of a lot of the crops that I grow. So I have to be careful that I know what was where and what was in it. So I'm not, say, planting carrots in a bed that's got a giant root ball of uh, an egg, you know, large eggplant in right, it. Right, right. Um, I'm coming so. back in because I think the thing that is crazy to me about this is you're doing three-ish things that are mainstays of a permaculturist approach in the small like it's not it really isn't going to get smaller than a square foot of soil right and about what and a cubic foot it's only a foot it's deep a cubic, i was going to say it's the eight i, I was going to think eight inches right. deep but it's, it's a little bit more than that but a cubic foot deep and to number one go no till in a sense as much as you could apply that word to a square foot box you're doing that right right without removing the root mass because as we know the root mass will break down and there's a lot of interesting benefits to that you're going to aerate the soil as it dies and you're not that that's probably the biggest problem for you is soil compaction is probably not a huge issue. No, that but, uh, that again is another part of maintaining the microbial life. Yeah, in the crates. Yep, as, as well as just if you rip the roots out, you you are ripping out organic matter that that will break down and, and build the soil. Right. Um, you know, it's composting in place in a way. 
cover crops, which again is a mainstay of a much larger operation. Then to me the craziest part is the crop rotation. I think we talked about it a little bit, but could you explain a little bit about why you would do that? So let's say you've got, uh, what do we have growing here? This is, a, this is a Ruby Streaks mustard greens. So you got Ruby Streaks mustard greens or a brassica family plant. Right. Right. And, and you grow through the season with this and you know you have a map and you have a, a chart of I've got brassicas in this sector. Right. I'm going to carry and, and the soil has the history of, of growing brassicas in it and all plants pull certain nutrient profiles out of the soil. Right. Which is the point of cover cropping or sorry, crop rotation in the first place. And you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to pair that with something that maybe pulls different ratios of those nutrients. So I'm not just ripping nitrogen out of the soil like crazy, right? Exactly. The, the more you grow one thing in the same place, yeah. it's going to continue to pull the exact same nutrients out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you, you can deplete that soil really quickly. Mm -hmm. Also, if, um, you know, different plant diseases and fungal diseases, bacterial diseases yeah. can harbor in that soil, in the soil. I would imagine here that's almost the bigger reason to do it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't I don't want to plant, you know, squash in the same bed where it all died of powdery mildew the year before. Yeah. I don't want to plant squash there again. Yeah, because I mean a lot of the recommendations for dealing with some of those fungal diseases that are once the, one of those, if they're in the soil, they're kind of in the soil for a while, yeah. is like either solarize the soil, which you know you don't really have the capacity or, or ability I, I to do I don't have the here. sunlight to do it, really. You know, yeah, you don't have the sunlight to do it, and also the stuff's going into the... You need this in production, you right. know? You can't be like sitting there for eight weeks and, and baking a square foot of soil. Right. You, you have the ability to grow for two years a plant that does not suffer from downy powdery mildew or blight or something like that on another sector and then just bring it back. Like, okay, three years, maybe let's try it again. Let's try it again right. see what happens with the squash in that particular crate. Which I, to me, I don't know, like the, my biggest takeaway from, from this farm and like the way you're approaching it is you're treating each crate as if it was a world. Right. And, and that approach is just so, it's not like, I wouldn't say it's like unique, but it's unique in the sense that you do it, you actually do it. Because a lot of people don't do that even with the bed. You know right. what I mean? They're just, they're sort of, it's, it's, it's the, to me it's kind of the difference between gardening and farming. I don't know. That's sure. just sort of my metaphor for thinking about it. Because as a gardener, you're more tending to a plant, and maybe you grow the and you might throw the soil away at the end of the season, or you're growing a house plant or something like that. Which all power to you. Any way that someone wants to grow, I love. But this is a different problem to solve. You know. Yeah. Well, and and one of the reasons I focus on the soil is simply that it's one of the few things that I can control here. Yeah. Um, you know, we're right on the river, super exposed to wind. Yep. Um, but I can't put up a 20 foot wall, a wind block, mm -hmm. um, you know, because this, this being visible is a part of why it's here. Yeah. Um, Actually, and what he does to, to, to put up a wind block is to do uh, trellised peas. So he's going to get something productive that can handle a bit of wind stress uh, that, that pretty much act as a windbreak. Right. But also advertise, like we were talking about with the sorghum. So people right. are like, what is going on there? Is there a trellis of peas like hanging out next to this fancy building? So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I can't control the sunlight I get. Yep. I can't control the wind. Yep. Uh, I'm. I know I'm going to be irrigating with with water that city is water. Chlorinated. Yep. You know the the place that I can really take control to give myself and more importantly my plants the best opportunity to thrive mm -hmm. is to really focus on the ecosystem in each in crate. The soil. Um, which which is a good approach generally speaking too. Like if like if you could pick one thing to control. I feel that I would pick the soil, even Absolutely. if I had, even if I had, you know, I was growing in like the perfect heaven of, of, of a plant paradise, where I would still focus on the yeah, soil Yeah, if first. you had life the soil, you wouldn't get... It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. So we've got two really interesting uh, flavor profiles, I guess you could say. It's the same plant, it's just different stages of its life. Right. And so, that's what we want to talk about in this final section as we kind of hang out and close up. One really, really cool thing about having a farm on site at a restaurant. Um, aside from all, all the obvious things, um, is that plants at different uh, at different phases of their of their life cycle are going to have different flavor profiles. Yep. Um, you know, it's micro arugula tastes different than 
you know, a, a full size, uh, mature arugula. Mm-hmm. And that kind of goes across the board with everything. Um, and so there are often opportunities to find unique flavor profiles, mm-hmm. you know, within one type of plant. So what we have here is bronze fennel. Um, and these are flowers of, of, these are both the flower of bronze fennel. Opened up and not opened up yet. So what we have here with bronze fennel, you're getting a super sweet flavor, uh, anise flavor. Um, with very popular with chefs. The open flowers are very popular with chefs yes. already. So that's kind of, this is what kind of what he was talking about. And I was like, okay, well this, you were saying a pint of these flowers, not only is it super expensive, uh, super flavorful and also sort of hard to get, but not when you're growing it right outside the restaurant. And that was interesting enough. And then he said, actually, if you eat the the pod before it opens up, you get a completely different fav- flavor profile, and that can be a, the difference of days. Right. Right. Well, I mean, and, that's it's, difference and, it, of, and it's flavor. It's also texture. You know, the yeah. the pods before they open up is kind of the the texture of a of a sunflower seed. Yeah. Um, so let's eat the let's eat the flower first, the yeah. open flower, and kind of describe that. So you get that anise sort of. Like fennelly, but it's sweet, but it has a sort of um, I don't know, somewhat astringent sort of taste to it. Yeah, to me. Um, but it is very nice and sweet. But the sweetness kind of like is quick, and then it fades away very like nicely. Yeah, and not much texture to it. Not much texture. It's it is it, you get like the the, str- the strings right as a texture, and then you come in with these pods, which again are it's the same exact thing. It's just not opened yet. And that's much brighter. Wow. It comes in later too. Yeah. You know, and and you, it sort of has a, a light popping texture to it. And actually, it almost tastes like a good and plenty to me. Yeah. It almost has a texture of a good and plenty because you have these, the shell, if you will. It's not really a shell, but the shell pop and then and then the flavor comes in. It's su- it's actually m- much more sweet. Yeah. But they, it takes a while burst. to get there. Yeah. To me, it feels like the flower, the open flower, starts sweet and ends more mild. Mm-hmm. And this starts mild, and then it goes whoop, and it, you get smacked in the face with like very, very sweet flavor. Mm-hmm. But yeah, to me, like that, that, that to me is like one of the most interesting things about this place, and something I never thought about about urban farming, is the interface between Jonathan and the chef. He can say, "Hey, chef, come out here. I just tasted this on a whim." And it's totally different than than the flowers that are prized already, and everyone sort of the chefs already know how to work with that. What can you do with this? And as a chef, like that that training allows him to go and and create a dish that, who knows, might be that might might make this place even more popular, right? Or might make a classic dish that that people had never even thought about eating before. So I don't know. To me, that was just so so fascinating. Yeah. Another example of something like that with radishes. When radishes bolt. Yeah. Um, Radish flowers are edible and very beautiful, mm-hmm. and then also their seed pods mm-hmm. that they set are edible, um, and that those kind of have the texture of like a green bean yeah. um, with like a, a intense radish flavor. Um, and so, through successions, we've got the opportunity to serve those radishes with radish flowers mm-hmm. and radish seed pods, yeah. um, which is the full life cycle of the plant on a plate, on one plate, on a plate, on, <laughs> on a plate, a hundred feet away from. I mean, a lot of these people, you can see around this corner here, there's the patio. And a lot of the people that are eating on the patio can kind of crane their neck around and say to themselves, at least, you know, 95% of what's on my plate that's a, that's a plant is, is right there, not a stone's throw away, which is just so cool. It's super cool. So, yeah, man, I mean, thank you for, Jonathan sent me a message on, on Instagram when I was coming out here and... I was, I'm just trying to meet farmers and, and learn some interesting stuff and, and my, for me it's about translating that down to the home gardener which is most of us. It's I'm a home gardener and I'm not doing any sort of urban farming project except for what I do at my own house. But I think like this challenge, the challenges that you're facing and the constraints that you have, much more than I'm going to face at my house. And then the efficiencies you're pulling out of something with so many constraints makes me think, okay, well, 
there's so much I can apply at my own house to get much better yields, much better flavors. Uh, and then also for me, like figuring out how to work things onto the plate is my, sort of my challenge for next year. Sure. Because like trying to, because for me, I'm I'm a sciency guy. I I'll grow an ornamental, or I'll grow an heirloom that's like much less productive but much more interesting. Mm -hmm. or like I'll grow peanuts in my front yard, which I should probably just buy the peanuts if I'm thinking about it from an economics sure. perspective. But but yeah, like figuring out how to work it into the plate and learning stuff like this, so super fascinating. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this long, long tour. I think that these long tours are really interesting. You get into the details, we can get really nerdy about it. And if anyone wants to find Jonathan, where can, where can people find you? Where can they kind of connect with you? So um, you can uh, connect with the restaurant first. Um, it's called River Park here in New York City. Um, come can, eat, come eat here. You can find them on Instagram at River Park NYC, and you can find me on Instagram at Farmer Jonathan NYC. Farmer Jonathan NYC, and which will all be in the um, video description, whether you're watching it on YouTube or Facebook. So, thanks, dude. Thank this you. Was awesome. This is super fun. I had a blast. I'm probably gonna run around like taking photos and and being a nuisance here. So, thank you guys for watching. Stay tuned for future videos like this. If you like tours, hit the comments and tell me like who I should go see next because I don't do this too often, but I think it's really fun to do. So uh, thanks for watching. Good luck in the garden. Keep growing, and I'll see you guys in the next one.